The Prophet ﷺ taught us that if you don't have anything constructive to do after Salat al-Isha, go to bed. Why? Wife is waiting for you. The problem with us, we'll go to bed but still be on WhatsApp until 2 in the morning. Right? Subhanallah. The wife tosses and turns this way and that way. I hope it's not the other way around, mashallah. But tossing, turning and you're not getting the message. Subhanallah. She's trying to touch you and you say, hey, wait. But where is the Islam in you? Your Islam should make you think, why am I taught to come to bed here? For what? I'm supposed to go to bed because I have a spouse. Why did you get married if you don't want to spend the nights with your wife? For what? Sit with her, talk to her, play with her, be intimate with her, fulfill her rights, satisfy her, go to bed, get up for Salatul Fajr or Tahajjud, and don't be ashamed to have a shower. Even if the whole house knows what happened at night, so what? It was halal. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to dress up for who? For his family. How many of you? And I challenge you, it's a Friday. We're talking of the best husband, the most, the, the most blessed of all creation, the highest in rank of all. I tell you one thing, we need to follow him. Let's not just pay lip service to it. It's not just about lip service, my beloved brothers and sisters. Dress up, you go home, take pride in your hair, take pride in your clothing, what you look like, what you smell like. You come home, they should look at you and feel attracted. Come on. The Prophet ﷺ was intimate with his spouses and he fulfilled that right of his spouses. How many of us, a month passes, we haven't even been intimate with our halal wife. She's busy waiting. She's dressing up. She's trying to attract you. So I'm tired. You're tired for what? There's an ibadah to happen at night. Some of us might be weak for tahajjud, but you can't come and complain that you cannot be intimate with your own spouse. You get a similar reward. Wallahi. And I'm not ashamed to speak about it. I've spoken about it several times because men are guilty of thinking that women don't have sexual needs. This was the Prophet ﷺ. He tells the companions, Fi budu'i ahadikum sadaqa. Remember when you're intimate with your wife and you fulfill her needs and you satisfy her, it is an act of charity. The Sahaba were rightly so. They asked a the question, oh wow, is it really a charity? He says, well, if you put it in haram, would you get a sin? So. They said, yes, we would get a sin. Well, if you put it in halal in a proper way and you're conscious of the fulfilling of the rights, you definitely get a reward. The problem with us is we're focused on another woman somewhere outside. That's what it is. We're focused on another person outside. Subhanallah. Astaghfirullah. May Allah protect all of us. Now when you come home and it's halal and it's a sadaqah and it's a charity and your wife has been waiting for you and at times she's actually looking forward to it. She's protected herself as best as she can. And you know what? You just say, I'm tired. Tired for what? If there was a football match, you would have forgotten your tiredness. May Allah forgive us. The general script, the general point, the general rule when it comes to intimacy is that everything is halal until proven haram. Everything is halal until proven haram. And then you look into the sharia, what are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited? What are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited? And you have three, actually four things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly prohibited. Four things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly prohibited. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited intimacy through the anus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited intimacy through the anus. Number two is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited intimacy when a woman is in her menstrual cycle. When a woman is in her menstrual cycle, and this takes the same ruling when she has postpartum bleeding. Meaning after she has a child, during that time, it is not permissible to be physically intimate with her at that time as well. The third thing that is prohibited in Islam is for one to be, um, you know, use that which is filthy to use that which is disliked. Now, we'll get to this concept later on with the Ta'ala, but just understand the general rule. Because over here, Islam didn't come to give specifics, but Islam just gave general guidelines. And then the fourth principle, and the fourth rule you should know when it comes to intimacy, is that Islam prohibits people being wasteful. Islam prohibits people being wasteful. So the first thing we mentioned is that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, He has made uh, intimacy through the anus clearly haram. And in fact, this is something that there's consensus on, that there's no disagreement upon, that this is prohibited. This is prohibited and is not allowed. Then number three, we said, a person should not be filthy. A person should not be filthy. What does this general guideline mean? This general guideline means, it encompasses two main things. 
Number one is the way that we speak with one another. So for example, living in our culture, there's this culture of you know, being very vulgar while having marital relations. That is not allowed in Islam. You know, to use bad words and to curse, even when a person is having marital relations with his wife, this is not the way that they should be. But rather there's a level of humanity and a level of dignity that needs to be retained. And this is something that you know, is left for the non-Muslims and has nothing to do with Islam. And you'll notice that, you know, you'll come to see this, that this is like one of the diseases of like watching pornography, is that you start developing cultures of intimacy that are not allowed in Islam. And then you view it so many times that a person starts to think that, you know what, this is the way marital intimacy is meant to be. This is the way that marital intimacy is meant to be. Related to this third point, uh, uh, this third principle as well, is that one should not be filthy. So you will notice that again, in Western culture, they'll use a whole bunch of products that are not, for the lack of, you know, better words, hygienic. They, they're, they're things that are, are not hygienic. I'm not going to educate you about them if you don't know what they are. If you know what they are, you know, seek refuge from Allah that you never find uh, someone who wants these sort of things. So those are the sort of things you have to avoid. Then the fourth thing is, that you're not meant to be wasteful, that you're not meant to be wasteful. And this is something that you know, you'll find in the books of old, that certain things that you're allowed to use in intimacy, certain things that you're not allowed to use in intimacy. So the question arises, are you allowed using food while being intimate? Are you allowed using food while being intimate? And the answer to this is yes, as long as you're, allowed, as long as you're consuming that food. So for example, you know, I'm going to throw out names of foods, you figure out what to do with them. So when you talk about like chocolate sauce, you talk about whipped cream, you talk about, you know, those sort of things. These are things that you're allowed to use. These are things that you're allowed to use. But at the same time, a person should not be wasteful. Now, why do I mention these sort of things? That as Muslims, there needs to be a safe space. You know, you'll notice that when a, a person will have a question, they're not going to feel comfortable to speak to the Imam. They're not going to want to speak to the brother that they see in the masjid. There needs to be a safe space. And one thing we definitely don't want is, you know, people going to the internet and trying to research, you know, should I be using this or should I not be using that? They don't have a, a, the level of morality and ethics that a Muslim is required to have. So I want to give you general guidelines in terms of what is allowed and what isn't allowed. And the reason why I bring this up again is because one of the biggest levels of frustration is because of this improper intimacy. That you know, the parents, they got the, the, the children married, they're like, Beta, Betty, you're now officially married, go figure things out yourself. The man who's never, the boy who's never had a boyfriend, girl has never had, uh, sorry, the boy has never had a girlfriend, <laughs> and the girl, the boy has never had a girlfriend, and the girl has never had a boyfriend. She's like, what do we do now? And then try reading these books by like Ibn Hazm and some of the scholars of the past, and they're like, what on earth is this? It seems like mechanics or something. It's very difficult, and that's why this needs to be discussed with our up-and-coming you know, teenagers and young adults that are getting married in a halal and in a mature manner. So those are the guidelines. Now in terms of actual intimacy itself, I want to explain the difference between intimacy between a man and a woman. From a man, if we understand what we said about him, he is very goal-oriented, right? He's very goal-oriented, whereas a woman is very experience-oriented. So for a man, it's about doing the task and finishing the task, and that is what will give him the greatest amount of pleasure, and he will be done. Whereas for a woman's perspective, it's not about completion, but rather it's about the experience itself. And this is what I want to share, you know, a very important difference over here. That there will be for a husband and wife, when, when they get married, there will be a time where a man will need to fulfill his urge. A man will need to fulfill his urge, and a woman will be like, you know what, let us go out for dinner first. Let us light some candles. Let us, you know, put on some nasheeds. And the man is like, that is, on the inside, he's being, like on the outside, he's being polite. But on the inside, he's like, this is not what I need right now. You know, I've just gone through some major fit now, something happened, and I need to fulfill my urge. A woman needs to recognize that, that at that time, he's not in the mood for an intimate experience. He just needs to fulfill his urge. At the same time, from a man's perspective, he cannot be greedy and selfish and think that this is the way intimacy is always going to be. There's a time to take, but there's also a time to give. So from time to time, yes, you will have to fulfill your urges, but at the same time, you'll want to make sure that you're giving back to your spouse as well. You'll want to make sure that you're giving back to your spouse as well. And this is something that you will learn to discuss with one another, experience with one another, and grow with one another. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of communicating over here. That a lot of times, you know, a husband and wife, they'll be having problems in their intimacy, but they're like, you know what? 
it's going to stay in the dark. We're not going to discuss it. We're not going to do anything about it. We'll just continue living as it is. But a breaking point eventually comes and nothing gets solved and the relationship eventually breaks down. So it's very important that a husband and wife, they, they, they agree amongst themselves that you know what? We may not know anything about intimacy coming into the marriage, but now that we're married, Allah has made us halal for one another. Let us enjoy this experience. Let us enjoy this experience and let us learn about it as well. So if there's something that you like, tell your spouse about it. If there's something that you dislike, tell your spouse about it. Rather than holding those feelings inside and repressing those emotions, deal with them up front and it makes things a lot easier. Rather than leaving your spouse to guess, do you know what does my spouse like, what does my spouse not dislike, you know, be open about it, be frank about it, but be, you know, ethical and moral about it as well, that there's no need for vulgar descriptions and be, you know, sane and humane and speak about it in a mature manner.